Everybody, welcome to Coffee Chat with Ellen Kay. We are so glad that you joined us. We apologize that it's taken so long for us to get the first episode out, but we have done it. Here it is. Um, yes. So right off the bat, we really want to give a shout out to Ed Perry, John Gifford, and Nicholas Knight. You guys have been, you were the first ones to subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much. And then to all of the other people who have subscribed after that, we really do appreciate it. So to let you guys know, this is Coffee Chat with Ellen K. And we thought, you know what, let's do a podcast where we talk about world topics. And also on each show, we are going to have a guest that we interview. So for today's topic, we yes. have decided to, to talk about this mm -hmm. idea of the dumbing down of pop culture, specifically in the music industry. And Kay, I was laughing. You, <laughs> sent, you sent me an article yesterday that yeah. it cracked me up because in my opinion, it, it is so true. And the title of the article is why music sucks so hard right now. <laughs> and so yeah. I wanted to turn it over to you. Why don't you start the ball rolling and sort of give me your general feedback on this entire topic of the dumbing down of the music industry. So, you know, this is, this is interesting. Right before we started, I was telling you that this morning, uh, you know, my husband and I were sitting down and we were talking about our youth and what music meant to us when we were growing up as teenagers. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I am of the, you know, the grunge era. That's, that was our time when it was just music was everything to us. It mm -hmm. was really everything. And we were talking about why things have changed so drastically. What has changed so drastically? Uh, we, we felt that we were kind of the last generation where music was, where musicians and artists gave everything to their art. Yes. So one of the things that we were talking about was that right now, everyone and anyone has access to their own little recording studio mm -hmm. at home. You don't have the backing of a whole team of people around you who are all uh, experts in their field. Mm -hmm. Then you had the artists themselves who honed their craft through hours and hours of of practicing and and recording and re-recording and concerts. And now a lot of the new quote unquote artists have never had any of this. There's no, no foundation, no bones, no mm -hmm. uh, blood, sweat and tears and passion that has gone into it. Yeah. Do you see that too? Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. I think that comes down to this cultural shift that we have seen in the last couple of decades where everything has become a participation trophy rather than working for something. The mass media has always had a relationship with pop culture, specifically music. Yeah. Um, and that's still the case today. Although in my opinion, I feel like that symbiotic relationship has, has moved from a symbiotic relationship to a force that's actually deliberately designed to shape consciousness and, and, diminish independent thought and, and independent feelings. And the problem with that with mass media is at the end of the day, whatever's going to be the most famous, whatever is going to be that song that everybody's going to hear is going to be up to the mass media. Exactly. And yeah. I, I think that's where the fault is because if the mass media would pick up on these individuals who are still doing music that has a real emotion and a real message and real, you know, quality to it, if the mass media would pick that up and put that out there, the public would eat it up. Exactly. I really, I really yes. feel like the public, it, it takes what it's given. And um, I, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? Because in, in my opinion, I feel like it's been a deliberate directional change. How do you feel about it? I do believe that. But my question is, why? Why is that happening? Why are they creating that shift? Yes. Well, there's obviously a lot of answers to that question. Um, and I've put a lot of thought into that and I have opinions about it because like you've, you've always heard me say, uh, I, I always feel like you have to step back and look at the entire chessboard. Right. Because if you look at each individual thing, you can always justify it away. But it's when you step back and you look at the whole board that you go, I see what's happening here. This dumbing down is happening in every field. 
Yeah. It's happening in education. It's happening in the schools. It's happening in literature. It's happening on the mainstream news. It's, it does to me seem to be a global attempt to keep people from independent thought and, and independent, um, personal goals. There's a woman mm -hmm. by the name of Susan Long, and she presented a paper at the Paris Symposium of International Society for Psychoanalytical Study of Organizations. And her paper was talking about this very thing, about the studies that are going on about this global dumbing down of society. And she said in that paper that intellectuals who were once prepared to risk themselves for what was right and what was true are now addicted to frivolous entertainment. Yeah. I found that fascinating because I think that that's what's happening. The, the more you keep people in that dumbed down situation, the less they are to be inspired to stand up for something. Absolutely. That may be yeah. controversial. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, how many times did you hear, if you look into, you know, the Beatles and John Lennon, there's a whole theory out there that the government was, was very afraid of John Lennon and the Beatles because of their influence on the younger generations, because of, of what they were sort of encouraging them to think about and, and talk about. And in yeah. my opinion, I think, I think that's a driving force behind this. What do you think? I absolutely agree with you. And you're right. This, this transcends the world of music. We're talking mm -hmm. about education. You and I have spoken about that oh, ad yeah. nauseum. There is, I think, this movement of keeping people from actually asking questions, exploring, communicating, thinking outside the box. Yes. It's, it might be a horrible thing to say, but it's, I think there's truth in this, that the more people stop questioning, stop thinking for themselves, the easier it is to control them. Absolutely. Plain and simple. Absolutely. I, you know, listen, you, you'd have to be blind to not see what's happening in the world. Yeah. Um, I know it's very scary and a lot of people want to just overlook the darkness that's happening, but the, the darkness that's happening in this world is, is exponentially louder than it used to be. And I see it everywhere. And I think you are completely right. One of the best ways to allow darkness to overtake people is to keep them in the dark about it. Keep right. them from thinking about it. Keep them from actually feeling, you know, something that's that's right and true and worth fighting for. Just like, you know, Susan Long said, people who used to stand up and fight for something that they believe, they're now playing Candy Crush. You can see it all around you. The younger generation, they are so hooked on technology that it has stopped them from, from really thinking on their own. They're so reliant on, uh, on technology for everything. Yeah. You even see that with the older generations. Yeah. We're relying so heavily on technology to do everyday things to the point where we forget how to exercise our mind. Yes. You know, I would love to see a study on the actual physical effects on the brain from relying on technology like this rather than independent thought. I mean, I know from past things that I've studied, a, a child who goes through emotional trauma when they're young, their brain actually physically develops differently because of that incident. And I have to believe that this technology is also changing the way the brain is actually physically functioning. I mean, Without I remember, I think you and I talked about this. I remember reading an article um, a while ago that the creators of the iPad and the iPhone yes. and all of these things, they didn't let their children use these things. Yep. And yet they're encouraging the rest of the world to. So that tells me they know something that they're not telling us. <laughs> yeah. And again, you don't even, even without looking into it, you know, on a, like you said, on a research level, you can see it with your own two eyes, right. what's happening. It was interesting. I was looking into um, Richard Hogart. He was an mm -hmm. author of a book called The Uses of Literacy. I think it was released in 1957. Um, but he said something in there that I thought was profound. And he was stating that, the idea is that mass culture imposed on people from above offers nothing that can really grip the brain or the heart. And it actually assists with drying up of a more positive kinds of enjoyment in which one gains much by giving much. I thought yes. that was spot on because to me, that's exactly what's happening in the music industry. Um, 
you know, the songs like we were talking about in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, there was so much in there that the artist was giving. Gave. The artist yes. was just, they dove Thank into you. something and they gave it. And as yeah. the listener, you gain so much from that. And I feel like the music lately, it doesn't, it doesn't touch on any of that at all. For no. example, here's, here's one example that Kay and I were talking about. Um, if you compare Bohemian Rhapsody uh, oh. by Queen. Now we want to compare that with uh, a song like um, Beyonce's uh, Run the World. There's a huge, in my opinion, a huge difference. Now, Absolutely. you know, Beyonce's a very smart woman. She's a very smart businesswoman. She has certainly made a huge success out of what she does. Um, so what we're talking about here is the music itself, not, not necessarily okay. the artist. When you compare the two, this is what I'm talking about, about the dumbing down of music. You know, for example, in Beyonce's song, um, you know, it took six producers and six writers and to come up with that, where it's a song where the line, who runs this mother, is actually repeated over 40 times in a, in a what, a three-minute song. So there's, <laughs> there's, not, there's not a lot of lyrical power to that song. Um, and the other thing about that song that, that bothers me, and I think this comes into what I see happening with the pop culture, is that the song is basically a celebration of somebody simply because they're a girl. I'm a girl, therefore celebrate me, I'm gonna run the world. Mm -hmm. And what bothers me about that is there's nothing in the song about what did that girl overcome? Who is that girl? What, no what is her character? There's no story. There's, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a celebration simply because of a label. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that has been what has been happening lately in this world, that it's no longer about character. It's no longer about what you actually do in this life or what kind of a person you are. It's the label. And that's it. Let me read a quote here. Um, and I let me let me see what you think uh, okay. about it. It says, ours is the age of substitutes. Instead of language, we have jargon. Instead of principles, slogans. And instead of genuine ideas, we have bright suggestions. I have that quote right here as well. And I was going to say the same thing. That is exactly it. It has become it has become a quick fix to the end. And it's, in my opinion, it's fake. It's not based on anything real. You know, there's... Well, where's the foundation? I would, where's yeah, the I would like to celebrate a girl who has actually accomplished something that was a disadvantage because of something that she was facing in her life yeah. rather than just a label. I, you know, Kay, I love you because you are an incredible person because I could list 5 million things that you do that I am in awe of because you are a spirit. You are a soul. You are giving, you are caring. I mean, I could go on for an hour. I don't care if you're a girl. <laughs> I I don't care if you're Greek. I don't care if you're white. I don't yeah. care if you have dark hair or blonde hair. That is not who you are. That's maybe what you look like, but that doesn't have anything to do with character. And yeah. I feel like the entire world has been deliberately pulled away from character. Um, yeah. And there are probably a lot of reasons why that's happening, which is probably another show we need to get yeah. into. But mass media has become this... Um, it's become this platform to create music that is that is supposed to be just like food. You ingest it, you throw it away, and then you have the next meal the next yeah, day. Yeah, recycle it. And Done. nothing, yeah, nothing is is sticking with you. But yeah. even in today's culture, the Beatles, Queen, Freddie Mercury, all of these music, the music that we were talking about before that had that heart and that soul, there are still people listening Smart. to that today. And there's Absolutely. a reason for that. We need that. Now, yeah, it's just, it's all about... It's all about the quick fix. It's all about the trophy instead of the process. And I think I think you lose so much of the human experience because of that. I think that's exactly at the core of everything. You you lose something so unique and so vital and important to the to the human experience. Do you think do you have a gut feeling is that intentional? I do. I, I do think it is intentional. Um, and I, again, I, I'm sure, you know, in later episodes, we're going to get a lot more into this. But yes, I do think it's intentional. And I, I go back to what I said before, because the more out of tune you are with yourself and with each other, the more easily Same. people can manipulate you. I truly believe that that is happening, not only just in my country, not only just in your no. country. It is a global movement. 
there's so much to to unravel here and yes. so much we have to get into. I'm so excited to hit all of these topics. We are going to. That is kind of what our show is going to be. We're going to take these, like we said, we're going to take big topics and discuss yeah. them. We're also going to talk about stupid little things, like the fact that Kay showed me a chart um, <laughs> last week about coffee because we love coffee facts. Mm -hmm. There is a factoid in there that 4% of Americans don't even buy coffee. I can't. That's just... I, I can't, who are these people, Kay? I don't get it. I really, I don't know who they are, but it's unacceptable, is what no, I say. It's you know, no wonder the world is such a hostile place. If you're not drinking coffee, of course you're going to be pissed off. Drink up, drink right, up, exactly. But we are going to continue this conversation with our guest today. So yes. we are going to bring on Mr. David Whitley. He is phenomenal. I'm sure most of you know who he is. He has been an incredible singer, musical theater performer, gospel singer, recording artist. Uh, for years. I have had the pleasure of working with him. Um, we are going to play a little montage here to uh, introduce you, to those of you who don't know who David is, to some of his work, and then we are going to bring him on. I've been so many places in my life and time. I've sung a lot of songs. I've made some bad rhymes. Something tells me good things are coming, and I ain't gonna not believe. I am looking for free. Ladies and gentlemen, we are happy to bring on the show, Mr. David Whitley. Hello, Hello. ladies. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm great. The montage that I showed you was a lot of performances that David did on The Voice uh, in Germany. Yes. Um, and David, why don't you give us, a, for the people in the audience who don't know who you are, why don't you give us a, a sort of a rundown of who you are, what you've done, and, and you know where you're kind of going with your career? Okay, well, for those three people who don't know who I am, um, <laughs> yeah, God bless their hearts, right? Um, you know. <laughs> My name is David Whitley. I'm from Washington, D.C. originally, and I went to Duke Calhoun School of the Arts. I've always known I wanted to sing and perform. So when I was 17, I moved to New York, where I went to Manhattan School of Music, got my bachelor's, and I went to Juilliard School of Music, where I got my master's. Then I started to perform all over the world, um, from Broadway to being given the opportunity to come to Germany for one year. And that's where I met the wonderful Lynn Lichty um, <laughs> doing Miss Saigon. And I was, that was supposed to last one year, this contract, and it's been 26 years now because I've only worked 26. in Europe. Wow. And so you still you still live in Germany, right? I still do, yes. But I travel a lot, so I'm in America a lot because there are performances that do happen there. Not a lot, but mainly my career is here. Now I've just become a, a part of the cast of Tina, Tina Turner, the musical. Right. Where I play Richard, her father. So the, those eight shows a week, you remember what that's like, Lynn, doing oh, eight yeah. shows a week. It's that's grueling. no joke. It's no and joke. Yeah, it's, it's, but it's beautiful to be back on, on the stage in that way. So yeah. I'm grateful. And you know, it, that's interesting because that ties into something that Kay and I were talking about earlier. You know, we our, our whole pre-conversation was about sort of the dumbing down of pop culture, specifically yes. the music industry. And one of the aspects we were talking about is you know, you and I come from from a place where you work hard and you yes. put in hour after hour after hour and you get on stage any chance you can. And, you know, you're just talking about doing eight shows a week that what, how do you feel about what you learn from something like that? How what you gain, how you grow as an artist when you're on stage eight times a week, as opposed to sitting in your living room doing a video that you hope a record company is going to put out there? Well, first of all, during a show, this grueling and eight times a week, there's no class or no type of preparation or school that can prepare you for it. Right. And I think that's what we're seeing with a lot of artists nowadays when they actually turn the mic on and you realize, oh, this person really cannot sing. Um, <laughs> right. Everybody's doing things in a room for themselves. And, and they have people around them telling them that this is great and this is, this is that and the other. And they're comparing themselves to real artists. And I think it's so dangerous because 
if you haven't put in the work, you're not really going to get great results. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what Do we're seeing. Think- Okay, you mentioned yeah. something so profound about how it's hard to find artists that you can really grasp onto that you, that move you. Yeah, and yeah. That's because people aren't singing about things of substance. Mm-hmm. You think about this, for ladies, if you will indulge me for a second. When we were growing up, we had like Luther Vandross, long ago and oh so far away. We had lyrics, we had voice. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, what are our kids listening to? That B word better have my MF money and then that, you know. Yeah, that's exactly, that's, we were talking that's earlier awesome. about, about comparing songs like Bohemian Rhapsody to Ooh. Beyonce's Girls Run the World. And okay. it's, the examples couldn't be more night and day. And it's exactly what you were talking about. That whole personal experience, that emotional journey seems to be missing from, from yes. songs these days. I teach, I also do a lot of vocal coaching and I'm so surprised at how many people don't have music in schools anymore. Didn't grow up yeah. with music being a part of the curriculum. Right. That's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is it, it's no longer considered uh, of importance. No, they, they, it's just been, and that has to do with the, the economy. The first thing to go when we are in a recession or a downfall financially are the arts. Mm-hmm. The arts, yeah. People Unfortunately. think yeah. they're not important. Where that's why I love living in Europe, and that's why I'm based here because the Europeans understand that art is a profession. It's a it's a gift. Do you uh, do you see any changes in that over in Germany? From you know, you and I went over there way back when in 1995, right? Have there been any changes over there, or is it consistently as strong as it was back then? Well. Germany and Europe has been hit by the financial crisis as well as the rest of the world, especially during the COVID um, pandemic. But one thing that the German government did do is protect the artists. Okay, so that's still, you still feel like it's just as much a priority now as it was in 1995? Absolutely, because people don't see it as something that you, uh, as a hobby, they see it as a necessity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To sustain their lives. Music, art, all dance is such a part of our culture right. um e- even as americans but we kind of like you said dumb it down because you want it to appeal to the masses and i get that not that calling people dumb but what i am saying is that there what has they're been being a, fed. yeah what they're being fed and you guys were talking about the ai i remember thinking to myself i used to laugh when you know you were walking to a studio and there was just a computer and it sounded like a full orchestra but it's yeah. all electronic right and I said, always say to myself, one thing they'll never be able to replace is the human voice. Mm-hmm. And then came auto tune. Oh. Auto tune. I, like, oh I hate auto tune. I was like, oh my god, maybe I spoke too soon. <laughs> maybe I can be replaced. You know, because you don't have to have talent nowadays. It's not about talent. Yeah. It's well, about- listen, you you can replace the voice but you cannot replace the human experience. You oh, can't no. replace or the emotion. The emotion. No. Yeah, you Ever. can't do it. They'll try, but you, They'll but you try. can't. It's yeah. like what we did to do what we did more than wonderful, yes. which I hope your um, audience members and guests will get to be a part of. Kay, you were just so much a part of that as Lynn and I was. Yes, Kay was in the there. studio when we recorded it. David, why don't you, for, for those three people who don't know our song in the audience, <laughs> why don't you explain how that song came about, what the song is and, and what we did with it? Well, actually, I don't want to talk to those three people anymore. Just, you know, <laughs> Come I'm on, give them a three. chance. <laughs> okay, I'll give them one more chance. This song, More Than Wonderful, is a song that I've known for many, many years. And one morning, I woke up, and I could literally, literally, just as clear as I'm talking to you both right now, I could hear you singing this, Lynn, with me in a duet. And I just, something just said, pick up the phone and ask her. Normally, I would procrastinate and say, I'll ask her one day. But I asked you then, I asked you then. And then you fill in the rest of the the story, if you will. What's fascinating (laughs) about that is at the time that David called me to do this, I was three weeks away from moving out of a three floor house in New York to South Carolina, including striking my entire professional studio that took the whole basement of my house. So it would have been so easy for me to say, I can't do this right now. I'm about, I'm a week away from striking my studio. There's no way that we can do this. this. And yet I was just like, well, let's, let's just see. Let's just try. Let's just see if it'll work. And so I said to David, well, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. 
Mm -hmm. We're not going to just, you know, get a backing track and, and throw something together. We're going to do this right. So I said, listen, I'm going to call Lendo Black, who the audience will see um, in our next show, because he is our special guest for that one. He is a phenomenal arranger. He has done all of my albums. Absolutely. I run to Lendo whenever I need wow. something done. He's Incredible. brilliant, brilliant. Because he, like I'm sure David would agree, Lendl captures emotion like no other musician that I know. Yes. He's phenomenal. So I said to myself, well, if Lendl can do it, we're going to do this. If Lendl can't, then we're going to have to just wait and do this another time. And Lendl is an Emmy Award winning, you know, top notch, works with everybody under the sun. I was like, there's no way I'm going to call Lendl and he's going to just happen to have time next week to do this so that we can record before I strike my studio. But this voice in my head just said, just call him. Just ask him. Let's see. <laughs> and I did. And Lendl said, I just happened to have this week off. I can do this for you. Amazing. And David and I, we got excited. We were like, this is going to work. This was the first time in my entire career that it was just like. Effortless. It just, it just the, the road opened up for this project. Can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, yes. tell us a little bit about the whole process, the whole setup, um, and how did it unfold once you guys were there together? When David got there, there was a time where David and I just kicked everybody out of the studio so that we could just sit <laughs> and talk it through. You know, you map out what you're going to do. Absolutely. And normally, I think David would agree, normally, you know, you got a pencil and a paper and you're writing everything out. This is A, this is B, this is this what is we're going to do here. Be. And David and I, honestly, we just... David, all I remember is we just started talking and I don't remember anything else. I honestly, and then we were recording and all of a sudden it just came out. Going back to what you were written, the original topic about music being dumbed down, that's the aspect that people are going to be missing with the, the dumbing down of music. They don't have this type of symbiotic union That's that true. we felt and, and you and i personally i think you can feel that in the music i, I think absolutely. you feel oh, absolutely it's palpable yeah. i remember yeah. it, when we had you i didn't do anything when you had finished recording the song do you remember that you played it in your living room on the speakers really loud and i remember i had goosebumps i remember and i, I just got them right now again just thinking wow. about it yeah it was so moving it, it, it was just so powerful. Mm -hmm. I, I remember I had tears uh, in my eyes and I wanted yeah. to, I should preface this by saying that this is a genre of music that I was completely unfamiliar with. I love that you mentioned that, Kay, just that you want the genre of music that you're not familiar with. And that's the beautiful <laughs> part about More Than Wonderful. It just simply, it, it speaks to everyone's heart. It's not even about being a genre. It's more about being spiritualist and emotion. Yeah. Um, I do remember at a time when stepping away from it and I really remember talking to God saying, what's happening here? What's happening? Because it was so, it's not my first time in a studio. Yeah. I've been many times in a studio, but nothing like this has ever happened in my life where it, I literally watched the process becoming something bigger than me in it. Yeah. And you know, one of the other things about that I, that I love to tell this story about is David, you were, you were saying when you had that dream when you woke up and you could hear yeah. me singing the first four lines of the song. Yes. And you said there was something about that that just grabbed you, which is what motivated you to call me. Well, what I find fascinating is when I first got the tracks from Lendl and I went down into my studio by myself just to run through it and just to rehearse it. And I had a moment where I just sang those first four lines mm. and I don't know what happened. I can't explain it, but there was something in those first four lines that spoke to me so much that when we went to actually record the song, I couldn't, I couldn't reproduce it. And I finally sat down with the engineer and I said, I don't know why, but you have to take the first four lines from my very first rehearsal when I just, when I just walked wow. into the studio and sang it. There's something about that that speaks to me and I need that in the recording. And then Beautiful. that's later, that's when David said that those were the exact lines that he heard when he was sleeping. And exact same thing. Yeah. <laughs> and then she didn't know this. She did not no, know this. So I didn't. this is, I've been given confirmation after confirmation. And Lynn, I'm going to ask you to um, share something about a conversation we were having because we, you called me one day and I was sitting on my sofa in my living room. Yep. And then in, in the window. <laughs> oh, yes. With what was over your shoulder in the window? Yes. 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 <laughs> David, this is going back to the lesson that David and I learned about when you 
when you when you give the control back to God, because it's not it's not in my hands, it's not in David's hands. And we we were having a, a Zoom meeting about the fact that we were running into a lot of trouble when we first released the song. There was just stuff that was outside of our control that we couldn't fix. Yes. And it was it was bothering us because we put all this work into it and the song means so much to us. Yeah. And we're we're having a Zoom meeting about, you know, what could we do? How can we fix this? You know, we're, we're trying to get back to our old habits of this is, you know, in our hands. And behind David was his picture window to the sky. And over his shoulder, I'm going to show a picture of it here. If you can see it, over his shoulder is a cloud that looked just like a hand pointing straight up. <laughs> And it was just like I said, David, you gotta, you gotta turn over your shoulder. Do you see what I see? Because you have to understand, I couldn't see it. I was looking at the screen, talking to Lynn, but she was looking behind me, and she said, "Turn around." And as I did, I just went, "Oh!" And, oh yeah, we both, we were both like, "Okay, we get it. It's, it's just, it's we not it. up to us." <laughs> it's almost God, like, That's like God saying, "Okay, I done told you once. I don't know how many yeah. other times I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> get out the way." Yeah. And, and this goes back to, again, back to. Um, dumbing down of things. Yeah. I feel like this is so powerful that it should be doing this and it should be here, it should be here. God is like, no, no, you're not understanding why I had you do this. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's not for all of the world to hear, or perhaps it is, but that's not in your control and that's not something you need to worry about. Yeah. You just simply need to do the work and use the gifts I've given you to make it happen. You know, and, and David and I, we do you remember the conversation that we had? I remember I was driving after we finally got the song out and, you know, there were things going on that, that we couldn't control. And, yeah. you know, I remember David, we just, we just said, you know what, this, this song really is not about us. It has nothing to do with us. This song might be here long after we're gone. Yes. We may not even know if this song affects somebody and that's okay. It's not supposed okay. to be in our hands. Absolutely. And you also said something adding to that. Where, as you said, you know what, David, you said, you, you asked for my advice and permission, actually. You said, what if, this is all on you, Lynn, what if we had the website where people could just hear it for free? Yes. I was like, my God, how, God, where'd she get her heart from? <laughs> my heart was not in that place. I was like, we're going to be rich. No. <laughs> but Lynn was like, because it's not about us. It's about it's the not. song, the message. And you did that. You said, I said, Lynn, you're right. That voice came again. This is why I wanted you guys to do it. What happens after that is already going to be icing on the cake. But the right. message is, let, let give it to the people. I'll take yeah. care of everything else you need. And he has, hasn't he, Lynn? Yeah, no, he's he's been. Hasn't he, Kay? God bless. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. I, I totally agree. And that's one of the reasons that, that we did that is, you know, you can buy the song if you want to. That's great. But if you just want to hear it and you don't want to have to pay a penny, you don't have to. You just go to our website. We'll leave the link underneath. You can hear the entire song for free. That's right. because to us, it's more important to get the song out than, you know, try to make a buck off of it. It's interesting, David, because ever since I've known you, you have been very strong in your faith. You have been a believer in Jesus Christ and in God a lot longer than I have been aware of that. And I remember the first conversation when I finally, you know, picked up scripture and started diving into that. And I talked to you about it. Yes. Um, that's when it opened my eyes to all of this. And so I would love for you to dive into a little bit because you do a lot of gospel music. You have done mm -hmm. church singing for a very long time. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about that side of your career? Well, that's where it all began for me, just singing in church. And there was this wonderful woman by the name of Dr. Betty Yates who gave me an opportunity to be a part of a Christmas play. Um, and that applause is actually what, where the bug, <laughs> bug bit me. I was like, oh, they like what I'm doing. And I didn't realize that I actually had a gift for it. So I just started to pursue it and in church singing Christian music. And then I realized there were different types of ways of singing like classical and other things that made your voice grow. So I started to take voice lessons. Um, and then that's how it all really, really began. But it began in church. Nice. And you still do singing in church, correct? Yes, I do. I do. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And as well as musicals, of course, and, right. um, and other things like that. But the main thing that I'm really, really grateful for is... Yes, yeah. please take a listen to it. We're very excited about that song. Oh, 
<laughs> with wonderful. We're very excited about that song. So that's what about you, Lynn? I mean, did you did you what was your first exposure to music? Oh geez. I, I'm I was born just gravitating to singing and music. My mother used to tell me stories that when I was a baby, mm. I wouldn't sleep at night. I would be crying. And she would she ended up just sticking me in front of the stereo and putting a record on and I would go to sleep. And wow. I would be quiet and I would listen. So it was in my DNA before I was even aware of it. I, I think I was probably singing before I was talking. <laughs> but, you know, that. it's interesting because it, it kind of goes back to what Kay and I were talking about earlier. I I dove into singing and music because music helped me deal with emotions that I couldn't deal with on my own. It helped me yeah. feel, it helped me understand the people around me, the world around me, myself. It got me in touch with who I am mm -hmm. in relation to everything around me. And it took me on a journey and answered questions I didn't know I had and posed questions that I didn't think about. And it was a, a passionate, personal, powerful experience. And that's why I started singing. And I, you know, kind of the conversation we were talking about before, I feel like yeah. that soul of music has has been slowly chipped away and is missing oh, yes. in a lot of stuff today. What, what would you say, David, are some of your biggest inspirations? I mean, do you have music or artists that you listen to now that inspire you or do you primarily go back to... The only to listen to myself. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> is that what you're trying to say, Kay? I, I'm not. I, I can read between the lines with you. <laughs> Quite honestly, I listened to a lot of what inspired me when I was younger: Stevie Wonder, Donny Hathaway, Luther Vandross. Um, there's so yeah. many artists that sang songs and lyrics. I love lyrics. Mm -hmm. And now when I really want to be inspired, I listen to a lot of country music. Because if you listen yes. to country music, wow. they, they tell stories. Yeah. And I love a story. In terms of this entire um, subject of dumbing down of the music industry in general, what is your opinion? Do you feel, do you have a gut feeling on if that has been an intentional direction? Do you think it's been accidental? What's your, what's your feeling on that? I think it's been it entirely intentional. Mm -hmm. They are um, industry, they're figures who just want to make money, mm -hmm. of course, and it's not about moving people or uh, inspiring people, it's about money. And so in order to continue to make money, you need to have more and more content. And it doesn't have to really mean anything, it just has right. to be mm -hmm. there. Right. So I think it's intentional. I mean, the fact that there are companies that control everything. A few companies that control all of the media, mm -hmm. they are going to continue to feed that cycle into whoever wants to hear what. Right. And if you don't know better, then you don't know. Somebody like a big record company will say to me, it used to be, David, we got these four girls. Wait till you hear them. What we need you to do is to take them in the studio and just help them with the harmonies, help them with this and breathing and just, you know, help them vocally. That was like 15, 20 years ago. That that was the call I was getting. Now I'm getting the call, David, we got these four girls. Wait till you see them. Mm -hmm. yep. when you see them. Yep. You believe how they look. Oh, and by the way, make them look like they can sing. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, they don't even try anymore. Mm -mm. So there's, there's a very clear shift. There's been a very oh, clear man. planned shift. Yes, yeah. I agree. It went from hearing to seeing. Um, and it's very rare when you see anybody that's not supermodel-like recording mm -hmm. something. It's a very visual um, genre now. Um, right. Just the music business. Right. You know, that's why I know I'm going to be a star. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> of course, David. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I love it. I love it. And it's not even so, about being a star right now. I just really love making good music with like what Lynn and I did and just yeah. doing a great show. God has really showed me so many other things and and the fact that he's protected me so. Yes. From an industry that's designed to just build you up, build you up and then drop you. Let me ask you guys something now talking about the highs and then the lows. Hmm. What were some of your biggest obstacles in your career? Lynn, you go first. Oh boy. <laughs> There's so many. I, For me, the biggest obstacle was actually um, a lesson I tuned into right from the get-go. 
the biggest obstacle is a lot of times the people around you. Wow. Um, e e including teachers in school, including coaches, oh, yeah. including people who are supposed to be on your team. There is a there is a lot of darkness in this field. And this Absolutely. is a subject matter I was actually suggesting to Carolina that we approach on one of our shows. But there is clearly a darkness in, in the music industry. Um, and there's a lot of it that's designed to tear you up, I think, so that you can be controlled. That's my opinion. David, what's your what's your uh, answer to that? The biggest obstacle? The biggest obstacle was truly myself um, and my pride feeling that I had to, uh, this was what success looked like. And if I hadn't reached that at this age or done this, I, I had failed. So I was my biggest obstacle. And then, but I put myself out of the way and God gently put me out of the way and said, this is what you were trying to, this is the um, quicksand you're about to walk in. Right. And I saved you from that. I don't really have to die to wait to see what all God has protected me from. Mm -hmm. He's showing me literally as I continue to go forward. Now I'm yes. sure I'm, he, one day he's going to say, remember you wanted to go around that corner and there was a detour. This is what, this is what was waiting. And I protected you from that. If you look back into your career, this is for both of you. What was one of the the single most moving mm. moments of your of your career? For me, it would be the voice of Germany when I sang a song for you. I loved that. I loved being on Broadway. I did a I was a, with the voice of Harlem and Friends on Broadway long ago. So the highlights I would say would be the voice of Germany and um, being on Broadway. What would you yeah, say, Lynn? Um, mm. I guess the first. A uh, major highlight for me probably would have been Lucy and Jekyll and Hyde. Um, oh, yeah. What a fantastic oh role. It was, I think they even said that our production of Jekyll and Hyde was actually considered the definitive production of that show worldwide. I would agree. It was, I uh, listened really, to that just the other day. Yeah. If it, someone like you, found right? Someone <laughs> like, Lynn, you sing, the, and she sings it in German, which is not easy to sing in. Which is incredible. Chance, yeah. Oh, you have to hear her sing. It's called Someone Like You in English. What's it called out of Deutsch? In uh, <laughs> Jemand wie du. Jemand wie du. Lynn, yeah. go look it up. Whoever's listening to the three people who like me, <laughs> go listen to Lynn sing Jemand wie du from Jekyll and Hyde. It's magic. Oh, it really, it really is. is. Thank you. You know, it's funny, know David, I wanted to ask mm -hmm. you this question because when I, I tell this story and people don't believe it, but it's literally true. When I first auditioned <laughs> for Miss Saigon, which was the first production I did over in Germany, I had no idea the show was in German. <laughs> no idea. Did you know that it was in German? I knew it was in German. Okay. Because you know, yes, I'm a that. professional. I'm, I'm I'm like, yeah, I'm the ignorant of, one. I'm <laughs> like a lot of people who have no to job. <laughs> Not in, in a different Walton. country thinking, you know, think it's going to be just in It's her, going to be in English, language. in Germany. Yeah, no, that was it's stupid of me. So but <laughs> You know what? what? My next life, I want to be as pretty as you so I can do, do stupid stuff like that. <laughs> Let me ask one question for both of you. What do you think, if you could just put it in a nutshell, what does it take to be in this business? To survive it and to Ooh. persevere and to succeed? If you could put it in a nutshell. Amazing question. Lynn, please well, um, indulge us. To succeed, to be in it, and to survive it are three different mm. questions, in my opinion. To succeed, sure. you need to be willing to play the game. I, I don't know how else to say it. I, I was, I, to a certain extent, would never, there were things that I would just never do. And, you know, you do, you do get to a point where you are uh, approached with things that you have to, um, decide if your moral compass will allow that to survive it. I think you need God. I, I really think there is such a heavy darkness in this career, in this field, in this business, in this world that um, you, you need to have a higher power in order to survive it, to, to persevere and succeed. You have to have uh, an internal strength and you have to be willing to lose things if it doesn't fit with your moral compass. Oh, that's wow. beautiful. Yeah. Beautifully said. Oh my God! How David, do you add to that? Yeah, how I mean, you, how would you that? nice setup, Lynn. I mean, what, what did you leave? <laughs> she put what, 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 what am I supposed to say now? You say ditto. <laughs> and that's exactly what I was going to say. Ditto. Quite honestly, I could add something philosophical or something, but 
at the basic core of it all is everything Lynn just encompassed and said. It's really that. I will add that you have to have a little self-assurance of what of who you are yes. because people will want to mold you yes. into oh, somebody yeah. you simply are not. Yes. It's very yes. superficial, this business. Yeah. Superficial. superficial, yeah. Yes, You've got to know yourself. And you don't be. have to know everything about yourself, but what you have to do is what Lynn said, and that's have a relationship with God because I agree. you can be swayed left and right and do all kinds of crazy things that you live to regret. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, it's interesting. You know, I don't know if you've noticed this too, David, but I've seen a lot of interviews lately of people who were big in the music industry who have stepped out of it. And they're actually outright saying that there's a lot in this business that's very satanic. Oh, yeah. And I, I have... I have really found that fascinating because the more I look into things that are happening, not only in the world, but in the music business from people who have been in the music business with my own experiences that were not as drastic as that. I, I believe it. I believe it too, Glenn. Yeah. I believe it too. So we've you gotta, you gotta it. be we've careful. Seen it. You gotta yeah. be in your, and prayed up, stay prayed up. Um, David, um, before we let you go, um, just, you know, kind of give us an idea of what your plans are, where you think you're going to be going from here. You said you're doing uh, the musical Tina right now. Uh, yes. What are your, what are your plans for the next couple of years? I have a few other contracts with different theaters, like the Simple Opera in Dresden. I'll be there this summer doing Blues Brothers. So I'm still doing, and I do a lot of recitals still. Um, sometimes I just take a pianist and I do, because, you know, in Germany, they have a lot of little churches and right. I, I'll just do a, a program like from Handel to Harlem, where I'll just start with some classical stuff and just and go into the gospel. Nice. Um, gospel music. So I do a lot of, and I do a lot of teaching, a lot of coaching. So that's what's, what I'm doing in the future. And that's what I'm doing now. As well. Nice. Very nice. David, we'll thank it. you so much for not only being on Coffee Chat with Ellen Kay, but being on the very first episode of Coffee oh Chat with gosh, Ellen Kay. Favorite. I love you both. Thank you so much for having we me. We do too. love you too, David. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. We'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thoughts to go. Oh, you know what that sound is, Kay? That is Thoughts to Go. Yes, it is. Now, what Kay and I like to normally do is just at the end of our show, leave you with something positive, something inspiring, something sweet, something funny, um, what we call Thoughts to Go. And um, Kay, permission to be completely self-indulgent with today's Thoughts Absolutely. to Go. Absolutely. <laughs> I just got two new German Shepherd puppies. And I, I can't, Kay. They're so cute. <laughs> this, is, this is Dev. And this is Kenya. Now, both of these names come from my books. Kenya comes from Winter Mountain and Dev comes from Hollywood Fire. And if you read my book, you will know what Dev stands for. Um, yes. And my dogs are always the heroes of my book, along with the leading man. Um, so these two puppies are adorable. I think they're going to be huge. I mean, right now in this picture, they're uh, only eight weeks old. Oh my gosh. Um, and they've already gained like seven pounds each from <laughs> when I picked them up. So. They're and fantastic. tell us, how, how many dogs do you have now, Elle? <laughs> yes. Well, right now I have five, <laughs> including the 165-pound German Shepherd. So anyway, oh, we hope that you have enjoyed Coffee Chat with Ellen K. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank we you. love you. God bless. And we'll see you next time on Coffee Chat with Ellen K. Bye-bye. <laughs>